Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here, and welcome back to the channel. Today I want to give a bit brief update about my dual scope Frankenscope. So on the channel, we've already built it together, so I'll have the link to that video. And we've also had our first light with it on M63 Galaxy. I'll also have a link up above to the video and also down below. And overall, it's been a very successful endeavor. There were still two unknowns about this telescope. One, how would I align both scopes together because they were not pointing at exactly the same point. You basically had the Galaxy M63 in the center of that telescope, but then it was to the bottom left of the frame of that telescope. Because M63 is a relatively small target, I was able to just align them and then crop to the galaxy effectively without any issue. But that's going to be an issue as we head into the nebula season. And there I want to be able to use the whole wide field of my uh, dual APS-C size cameras. I also want to make it clear that I've been documenting my journey just for the fun because this is what I love doing and I really wanted to make this dual scope since suddenly I had all of the equipment to be able to do so. But I hadn't realized that now with a large audience uh, some people might try to imitate, imitate me. Uh, it should be no noted that smart that those dual telescopes, they're really hard to put in place, really hard to align together. They can suffer from issues like flexure. And overall, you'd probably be better off with just a larger aperture Newtonian, like an 8-inch or 10-inch Newtonian single one on your mount rather than dual telescopes. For me, the main advantage of this is, unlike my, my first light, which, is, which was just a first experiment, is to be able to capture the same target at the same time with different filters. And I actually managed to do that very recently with M51. I'll show you very briefly how it looks like later in the video, so stay tuned. Because for M51, I used a lumens filter for broadband imaging, and then here, I used a dual band narrowband filter so that I could capture the nebulae within M51 and hopefully I can merge the two together. And during nebula season, I want to have like a hydro hydrogen alpha oxygen 3 dual band filter here. And then here, I want to have a sulfur 2 oxygen 3 filter so that in one fell swoop, I have all of the colors or all of the band passes and signal that I need to do a full Hubble HSO palette. So that is to me the big advantage of a dual scope setup. But for most people, you, sh you would be better off with a single telescope. Now, a second uh, thing that I mentioned, by the way, was flexor. Uh, flexor, could it be an issue? Um, basically, it is during, with a Frankenscope system, only one of the scopes for me is guiding the mount. So it is basically keeping track of stars, and then if those stars deviate a tiny bit, it tells the mount to correct to keep the star centered. Makes sense. And I use an off-axis guider that is integrated in my ZWO ASI 2600 MC Euro camera here. By the way, all of the links to this equipment are in the video description if you are interested. That means that while the guiding should be perfect for this telescope here, what about that one? In theory, if they are very rigidly put together, there should be no issue. But in practice, because they are kind of split from one another, and they're only held together by this plate that I have underneath, we can have what we call differential flexure, which is that this telescope tracks perfectly, and this one also tracks pretty well, but the uh, plate that links the telescopes together bends ever so slightly, even by a few microns, and that's enough over a long exposure to have star trails on the secondary telescope. And we'll have a look at whether flexure uh, occurred with this uh, setup because finally with my F51 image I took 60 second exposures with this telescope here and 5 minute exposure with the unguided telescope effectively. So 5 minute exposures should be enough to tell us whether we have some uh, flexure. And we'll have a look inside later in the video. The first order of business though is that the first clear night that I had in weeks, or second actually clear night that I had in weeks, I spent several hours aligning those telescopes together, and let me tell you, that was not easy. My first thought for that was to buy a device like this one. So I actually bought <laughs> the device, as you can tell, which is a device where you can adjust like the x-axis and the y-axis via a knob at the back to really very precisely 
uh, change the aiming of your telescope. So this is an aiming device. And I got this one for around, I think, 180 US dollars on AliExpress. I'll put the link down in the description if you're interested. But once I started uh, using it, so I put this telescope, the lighter of the two, on top of this, I noticed that there was a lot of potential wobble on the uh, x-axis. And this is because it's effectively a single screw. So both sides turn at the same time. And the, uh, the axis of the point is held in place via the backlash of the gear that we have in there, but also the spring here. And that spring is simply not strong enough for something as large as a Newtonian telescope. It was, I, I was able to make it wobble with very little uh, force, which means that wind, which is very strong on this balcony very often, would have wreaked havoc on uh, all my imaging sessions. So I was not able to use this. That said, this would work ex excellently on uh, a refractor. So it's not something to be dismissed either. And it is overall very beefy. So $180, it is much cheaper than the much better quality options from ADM accessories. I also have links to that, but I simply can't afford that right now. So this was a failure. And because I don't really need it, I'm gonna sell it on like auction site or something like that. So what can I do instead? Well, I can listen to you guys in the comments because you guys are truly helping me out. But let's start with the principle. There are two axes we want to play with, with one of those telescopes. We just want to align one of the other, one of the telescopes to the other. Once that's done, we're good. So we only need to touch one telescope, right? That is the basis. And we need only to align in the x-axis, so uh, left, right here, parallel to the, uh, to the telescope pointing axis, and to the y-axis, so up and down uh, like this. Very, very simple. How can we do that? Well, we have a dovetail saddle like this, and we have a dovetail that fits into it. So we could use tiny spacers under the dovetail to make it go like slightly higher, so it points higher, or if you want to make it point downwards, you can put the uh, spacer on the other side as well to force it to push it pointing downwards. And then you can also do the same from the side. We have knobs that uh, will basically push the dovetail against the opposite side and leave it in place here. And you have two little uh, areas here that extend uh, further. And those you can add spacers here to adjust the placement. The problem is that this is at an angle, so it will affect not only your x-axis, but your y-axis to some extent, which is a bit painful. So with that, I bought a feeler gauge, which is basically a set of uh, blades of different thicknesses, starting with just uh, 0.04 millimeters and all the way to uh, 0.9 uh, millimeters. So it's a lot of I have never used one of those, but basically I can take those uh, slices of metal off and then just add them to the, uh, to the dovetail plate to act as a spacer. And it's very precise because I can change the thickness that I put in very easily. And I just need to uh, put one in, see what happens. And if it's too much, go for a thinner one. If it's too little, go for a thicker one and rinse and repeat. And will it surprise you that things did not go well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things did not go well. So I wanted to adjust basically this Skywatcher telescope and the dovetail has a middle part here that I could be using for the, the purpose, but it just did not work out for me. So I had to abandon that plan. But there is something else that those Skywatcher mounts have that I used to hate. And this is something that one of my comments uh, uh, pointed to me is these screws. Those are, the center one is a pull screw. The other two are push screws. What can you do with those? You can adjust the distance between the dovetail plate and the ring that holds the telescope to the dovetail plate. Therefore, using those screws, you can very precisely adjust the Y pointing direction, the vertical pointing direction relative to the dovetail plate. So I had my solution for the uh, y axis there. And so what about the x axis? Well, for the x axis, the feeler gauge actually worked. You can even see that feeler gauge here. 
And I noticed that instead of playing with the thickness of the gauge, what I could do is slot it in more or less and that adjusts the angle more or less. So that was much easier than changing the thickness every time. And it took me hours and hours. It was extremely, extremely frustrating. I cannot even de begin to describe how frustrating it was. And I had work the next day and I was, it was past 2 a.m. when I got it finally done. Oh, but finally it was done. Uh, and we can go inside and see the results. But before that, this is something that I don't, I don't understand why we don't have dovetail saddles with simple, like we could have a, a drill hole here that goes all the way to this side and have a worm screw in there or something like that uh, with a soft tip or whatever. And we can have the same thing at the other side as well. A, a hole drilled in with a worm screw through. And then you can just like screw in and out the worm screw to adjust the X axis as you wish. So much more precise than uh, having and easier than having to use that because that's such a torture to put in place in the first place. And then you can have exactly the same thing. Just make your saddle long enough that you can have tiny hole driven uh, through the, the bottom of the saddle with a tiny worm screw in there that you could use to raise the dovetail plate a little bit and have enough play, you know, in the angle that you have here to allow for like maybe a millimeter, it's only what's needed really most of the time. And then you'd have a very budget, very easy to use XY aiming device for small changes in, in direction. And that could work for a lot of those dual frankenscopes, be super stable, because once it's set in place, it's set in place, be adjustable as you wish, and not have any wobble like this thing has for larger telescopes. So any, any uh, does that make sense? Uh, it's, I, I'm not a DIY, a DIY type of guy. I'm terrible at that kind of project. So please let me know down in the comments whether that would make sense or not. And uh, if someone wants to actually make such a solution, please make it and sell it because it would be helpful for anyone attempting to do a dual uh, telescope setup. While you're going to the comments, you can like the video. It takes one second and truly helps the channel out. You can also subscribe to the channel if you're new to the channel, in which case, welcome. And if you want to, ch to help the channel even more at no cost to you and you're planning on buying anything like some of this equipment here from Agena or Amazon or High Point Scientific or First Light Optics, if you do so after clicking the links that I have in the description, it helps the channel out at no cost to you. And if you want to help even more directly, you can join my channel as a member using the join button next to the subscribe button, or you can join my Patreon as a paid supporter. I have the link down in the description. Channel members, Patreon supporters, you know how much I am thankful to you guys. The channel would not exist without you. So as always, thank you so much. Anyway, let's go inside and see what the results are. And now that we're inside, we can see the results of my fiddling around with the Frankenscope, which as you saw was quite a lot of pain. Uh, but let's look at how well those telescopes are aligned to one another. So on my screen, I have on the left is the image from my Quattro 150p, so the Skywatcher telescope, the black one. Uh, and on the right is the one with the red accents, the Carbon Star 150. And if I bring uh, one over the other, like we have very, very close centering, I'm very, very happy by, why, by what I'm seeing. And there's like some field of view uh, lost. You can see those two stars at the top they're uh, slewed a bit more so we have like we, we lose this area here and conversely we would lose the same area on the uh, right and on the azimuth side of things you can see we have those two stars here that correspond to those two stars there and we have that little one here which is this one there and then there's this one here ah uh, but it's not on that frame right so we're losing roughly this area on both uh, sides once we, once we stacked. So it's not as bad as it could be. And as long as I'm not doing mosaics for nebula, this is going to work perfectly well. But again, it would be nice if we had like this dovetail saddle with the modifications that I mentioned, because I think that could be a low budget, 
yet very stable way of doing the aiming of the two telescopes together. Now, how about Flexure? So this is uh, the image from the uh, telescope that has the guide camera. And you can see the stars are pretty much pinpoint there. Um, so very good guiding that was going on. No deviation whatsoever. That was based on a 60 second exposure. And of course, you have five 60 second exposures in a row. And uh, during the whole time, the guiding was around 0.6 to 0.7 arc seconds. So very, very decent. Let's look at what happened with the Quattro 150p. And if I zoom in on the stars of the Quattro 150p, I see they're not bad at all, but you can see they're elongated kind of towards the Y axis, right up and down here. Um, so I assume, and yeah, it's more visible there, you can see they're oblong. Those stars are oblong, where on the right hand side, they're pretty much round. And yeah, I mean, Honestly, I don't think it's a big deal, but this is an example of the impact of flexure. This differential flexure between the scope that is guiding and the scope that is being guided. You can get this kind of, the same kind of stuff if you're guiding your uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope or any long focal length telescope with an external guide scope. You could have a slight differential flexure between the guide scope and your main telescope, even if you're sure that it's super solidly put together a few microns is enough to make this difference and we can see it here. So I'm probably not going to be able to do anything about that, that flexor, but this is something I'm just going to have to accept. And just to give you an example, this is what we're able to capture in a single night without changing any filters. Uh, we have the luminance on the left and then we have the uh, H alpha oxygen three on the right. I still haven't figured out how to properly merge those two images together, but that is the fun of a Frankenscope that is a dual scope like that. Uh, if you are, are not planning on capturing the, the same target with different filters at the same time, or maybe with different focal lengths or anything like that, then I think, again, it makes more sense to just have a larger uh, scope on, on your mount rather than a dual setup especially with the difficulties of aiming the telescopes at the same point, which really got me extremely frustrated. And things like differential flexure, which can, you know, make your, your day a really bad day or your night a very bad night in a hurry. Do you have any comments on that? Have you tried a dual scope? Do you want to try it even after seeing this video? Let us know down in the comments. At the same time, please like the video. If you enjoyed, it takes one second, it truly helps. And if you're new and you wish to subscribe, you can click that subscribe button. And in that case, welcome to the channel. But more important than all of that, thank you so much for watching. I hope it was interesting to watch. And don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.